good afternoon one and all this is dr shubha devedi associate professor department of biotechnology school of life science and technology iamt university merit uh, it gives immense pleasure to communicate that iams iac iamt university along with research and development cell of iamt university is going to organize popular lecture uh, under the sponsorship of department of biotechnology ctep government of india on the topic natural protein antibiotics effective solution to the looming threat of antimicrobial resistance in future with the objective of popularization of biotechnology and to bring general awareness among mass about the basic concepts of biotechnology is an advancement and potential of modern biotechnology eminent speaker of today's session is professor sujata sharma department of biophysics all india institute of medical sciences new delhi welcome you ma'am thank you thank you shubham thank you so much ma'am uh, before starting uh, the talk uh, i i am also welcome i am giving my uh, heartfelt thanks to the uh, chancellor of iimt university yogesh mohan ji gupta uh, managing director of iimt university uh, shri mayank agrawal ji and uh, vice chancellor of iimt university professor deepa sharma thank you so much ma'am for providing all type of support uh, i am just uh, reading a brief profile of today's speaker professor sujata sharma madam uh, she is a protein structural biologist biophysicist writer and a professor at the department of biophysics of the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi she is uh, she is known uh, for his for her research uh, she is known for her studies in the field of protein structure drug design and antimicrobial drug resistance she has been awarded the international toas prize for science popularization and the peak life women inspire award she has also been awarded the prestigious national bioscience award for career development and national women bioscientist award by the government of india she is a recipient of kalpana chawla excellence award for her contribution in science and literature she is the author of five science fiction books kovi's promise tumhara bholu warriors in white the secret of the red crystals and the dragonfly's purpose uh thank you so much ma'am uh, for considering my invitation for today's talk uh, i just uh, not taking much of time i just hand over to you ma'am and i am giving all rights of this uh, zoom meetings to you thank you so much shubha it's a great honor for me to be invited on this uh, very eminent platform that you have created and uh, it's uh, very very uh, important to popularize science in the society and of course uh, these lectures would be uh, a good medium to do that and uh, i think i'll start sharing the screen already i yes, i have provided all the rights to you ma'am you are host okay. all right so you can see the screen now yes it is visible ma'am okay so the topic of today's lecture is natural protein antibiotics the effective solution to the looming threat of antimicrobial resistance in future so um, i will start first by giving an introduction of the kind of work that we are doing in our lab in department of biophysics aims we are working on several proteins uh, and uh, these are some of them that we are working on and um, the basic uh, thrust of our work is antimicrobial drug therapeutics and for that we used two approaches two strategies one is that uh, we uh, solve the structures of natural antimicrobial proteins or uh, peptides so that we can further develop them into uh, the drugs for tomorrow secondly what we do is that, uh, we focus on certain uh, resistant bacteria like acinetobacter bromonii and we develop ligands against those bacterial protein targets so these are the two kinds of approaches that we use and this is the approach that we use we use protein structure based drug design that is uh, this means effectively that we are studying the map of the protein which is implicated in a disease which leads to drug design so uh, 
the main focus yeah. is to solve the three dimensional structures of proteins which are implicated in microbial pathogenesis and uh, this is just an example to show you that uh, the entire red portion is the three dimensional structure and the green channel is the substrate binding site and the uh, blue residues are the active site so what we do is that we design and synthesize molecules that can bind to the active site with high affinity because those particular molecules are going to be the potential future drugs so this uh, is basically a slide which shows three scientists who have transformed drug design earlier before uh, these scientists contributed drug design was an arbitrary and a rather um, uh, rather uh, you know it was dependent on luck and serendipity um, but these are the ones who gave us a certain rational direction to drug design the first one is of course roentgen willem roentgen who got nobel prize in physics in 1901 he discovered x rays second was max lavey who got nobel prize in physics in 1914 he is the one who showed that crystals are able to diffract x rays and that is very important because when x rays are diffracted then we are able to elucidate the three dimensional structures of uh, that particular uh, compound in our case it is proteins and finally alexander fleming who got nobel prize in physiology and medicine in 1945 he was the one who discovered by chance the first antibiotic and that is penicillin so before i go into antimicrobial resistance uh, i wanted to show how a bacterium cell looks like so bacteria are basically prokaryotes that means a single cell they are unicellular and they were in existence as long as 3.5 billion years ago so that makes them one of the oldest living organism on earth now if you see a bacterium cell then you don't have a nucleus over here but you have uh, uh, basically the genetic material floating like this there is a cell wall right outside and inside that there is a cell membrane and then you have other organelles like flagellum pilus and fimbria they, they these are mainly important for sensing or moving or signaling or binding so this is the pre antibiotic era that is before the first antibiotic was discovered this is how it used to happen there was trial and error approach on naturally derived substances and there was random screening of plant and animal secretions there wasn't a very definite scientific direction to this and the result was this that smallpox cholera diphtheria all these bacterial diseases were rampant the average life expectancy at birth was 47 years and that these infectious diseases accounted for high morbidity and mortality it was expected that if you have a bacterial disease then you would quickly just die or fall seriously ill because there were no antibiotics to treat and then everything changed in 1928 when penicillin was discovered by chance by alexander fleming on september 28th he said that when i woke up just after dawn i certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic so what had happened was that alexander fleming had come back from a holiday and he had found that a petri dish which contained a, a bacterial uh, a, a bacterial uh, dish it was completely contaminated by a certain mold and he did not know what that mold was but he saw that wherever the mold was the bacteria had stopped growing over there so this mold was called penicillin and it was effective against all gram positive pathogen and he published his paper in british journal of experimental pathology in 1929 even though this had occurred it was not as if right after he discovered that we saw a lot of antibiotics in the market because his discovery was not taken very seriously and it was only much later in 1940 when two more scientists called flory and ernst chain they mass produced it and it started getting used in world war 2 and only after that only after 1945 did all the other antibiotics started getting discovered and um used so now basically let me simplify this what is antibiotic it just means antibiotic that means against life in this case it means bacteria or other microbes action is bactericidal that means it either kills bacteria or bacteriostatic that means it stops the growth retards the growth and it some bacteria can be both bactericidal or 
<clears throat> some antibiotics can be both bactericidal and bacteriostatic. The spectrum of activity could be broad or narrow spectrum. So these are the mechanisms of actions of antibiotics. That is why I had shown the structure of bacteria in the beginning, so that we can understand that uh, how, uh, what are the various ways that antibiotics uh, attack. First is that uh, it, they can inhibit, a, inhibit the protein synthesis by acting on the ribosome. Second, they can inhibit, inhibit the nucleic acid synthesis or they can inhibit the cell wall synthesis. Actually, cell wall of the bacteria is very, very important. That is because uh, this is what controls the you know, pH, the temperature of the bacterial cell, and also it uh, regulates the entry of various substances inside the bacteria. So cell wall integrity is very important. So if you can inhibit the cell wall synthesis, then you can kill the bacteria. Then, of course, disruption of cell membrane function. This is also very important because that's also um, a kind of a structure which uh, makes, a, uh, makes this particular bacterial cell extremely safe. And finally, blocking pathways and inhibiting metabolism. So these are all the mechanisms of actions of various antibiotics, which are summarized like this. And Alexander Fleming, when he got Nobel Prize, he had said, a particular thing. It said that the time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there is a danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself. And by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, he makes them resistant. So that means Alexander Fleming knew back then that this danger is looming upon us. And uh, dosage, of course, is very important. And sticking to the right dosage or the right uh, uh, number of days that it is given to us is very important, but sadly, that is not exactly how it went about. What happened was, now this I've just made to show that there was a pre-antibiotic era, discovery of antibiotics. There was an overuse or misuse of antibiotics all over all these years and antibiotic resistance occurred. And what are we facing now? We are facing a post-antibiotic apocalypse. That means there's a ticking time bomb where there would be a worldwide return of bacteria that means we are going back into the pre-antibiotic era. This again, just a timeline according to the years. 1928, it was discovered and uh, 80s quest for antibacterial drugs seems to be over. It seemed that we are already over this crisis. But in 1990, worldwide resurgence of bacterial diseases began again because of antibiotic resistance. And now that we are in 2000s, threat of, to, of return to pre-antibiotic era. So this is how antibiotic resistance happens. Like if you are infected by a lot of germs and most of them are uh, responding to drugs, there might be one which is resistant. So if you give a small dose of uh, that particular antibiotic, all of those will die. The resistant one will remain and then that will start multiplying. Not just that, you, using vertical gene transfer, it can give drug resistance to other bacteria. So that is how this uh, antibiotic resistance is growing. So this is how antibiotic resistance uh, occurs. These are the mechanisms of action of bacteria. Bacteria are basically fighting back. They do not want to get killed by your antibiotics. And this, these are the mechanisms that they have devised. First, they restrict the antibiotic access by changing the entryways or limiting the number of those entryways. Basically, on top of the bacterial cell, there are some entry ways through which your antibiotic is able to get inside. So they, what they do is that they restrict that. Secondly, they, they, they start making pumps on their surfaces. They pump out the antibiotic using the, those newly formed pumps in the cell walls. Third is what they do is that they change or destroy the antibiotics with enzymes that break down the drug. So they, they basically upregulate certain enzymes which are able to change or destroy these antibiotics so the antibiotics are not able to act. What they also do is they change the antibiotics target stereochemistry. Like basically all these, some of these antibiotics go and bind to certain bacterial enzymes. So what they will do is that bacteria, uh, when they want to get resistant, they change the stereochemistry so that the drug cannot no longer recognize it and cannot bind to it. And finally, they develop new cell processes that avoid using the antibiotic targets they basically change their pathways or they make new pathways so that this is completely bypassed. And 
finally coming to what are the causes of antibiotic resistance first as i had said overuse of antibiotics people are just eating antibiotics uh, the moment they get a cold or a cough they start self medicating and uh, that is a very big danger because they are also not using uh, a proper dose like non compliance of antibiotic dose as i had mentioned before that uh, they sometimes will give themselves an underdose and uh, that will just lead to antibiotic resistance third is lack of new antibiotics we do not have new drugs coming on as antibiotics so we have to depend on the old antibiotics to which now most of the bacteria are developing resistance then another cause is overuse of antibiotics in livestock what is being seen is that whenever the livestock falls ill immediately um, a non discriminate use of antibiotics takes place which what happens is that the, the same livestock livestock is giving us uh, various uh, uh, things like milk or meat and we are ingesting it and we are simply developing resistance and finally the high risk of infections in hospitals in hospitals where uh, a certain hygiene is not maintained or uh, measures are not taken regulatory measures are not taken their antibiotic resistance flourishes and of course now that covid 19 has come then antibiotic resistance seems to be getting worse and it is expected that in the coming few years antibiotics is antibiotic resistance is going to just get phenomenally high that is because of two reasons two or three reasons one is that uh, people are self medicating as i had said and of course doctors all over the world are also giving uh antibiotics to people who are having covid now covid 19 is a viral disease and only in very few cases you have secondary bacterial infections for example in this uh, you can see that only 6.9% of covid 19 patients uh had secondary infections but almost as high as 88% of uh, patients were given antibiotics so you can imagine that how much indiscriminate use of antibiotics has started with covid 19 so what we can do to fight covid-19 in amr is that reduce unnecessary antibiotic use with short turnaround time for covid-19 test secondly differentiate between viral and bacterial infections and third make informed decisions about when antibiotic therapy can be safely discontinued now what is also happening is lockdowns are occurring people are unable to find access to doctors and that is also leading to people self medicating and uh, uh, that of course it's expected that covid-19 is going to escalate antibiotic resistance to a great magnitude now i had explained uh, basically what kind of different mechanisms that uh, bacteria use to uh, get resistant to antibiotics i kept a special slide for biofilms because uh, this is one phenomenon that is occurring with many bacteria nowadays and it is highly complex you almost feel that bacteria are intelligent life forms because of the formation of biofilms as i had said earlier bacteria are unicellular they are single cell uh, organisms but biofilms are colonies of bacteria what has been seen recently is that there is bacteria started making biofilms they are emergent communal form of bacterial life they started learning to live with each other like you can see clusters of bacteria This is a leading cause of infections acquired in hospitals because these biofilms they grow on medical devices such as heart valves, pacemakers, and catheters, and uh, they block the access of bacterial biofilm communities from altered pH, osmolarity, nutrient scarcity, mechanical and shear forces, and also from all the antibiotics and host immune cells. So they are fa basically forming a kind of an armor, and it is seen that they signal each other extremely well, and uh, they are able to. generate extremely impregnable colonies and this particular diagram at the uh, bottom shows how it occurs first unicellular um, bacteria get together they attach themselves to a certain surface then a micro colony formation takes place then it matures and once it matures then there is a kind of an explosion you you know just like a pollen formation then the, uh, then in the end the pollen simply explodes and uh, it is taken to different sites the same way this particular 
um, this particular bio, mature biofilm explodes and these uh, single cells are seeded in different areas, other areas, and then they start making biofilms over there. So this is how the infection keeps on increasing and the resistant bacteria completely take over the human life. And this is extremely, extremely worrying. So after giving this background, it is obvious that the need of the moment is that we need to form, we need to discover new antibiotics or we need to find certain drugs which are already being used for other diseases but could also double up as antibiotics, which is known as drug repurposing, which could combat the resistance. So the reason why we need to do is, of course, antibiotic resistance. Also, new diseases are coming as COVID-19 has come. New diseases are coming all the time and we need to do this immediately. There's an urgent need. And third, of course, to improve efficiency and reduce duration of uh, the drugs. For example, in case of tuberculosis, since last 50 years, we don't have any new drugs. We are still using the old drugs. So we need to discover new drugs immediately. So uh, the question is, where do we look for new drugs? One, one particular way is that we look at synthetic drugs that we have and we keep on changing the stereochemistry shape or we keep on changing the charges and keep on experimenting. However, there is one more way and that is antimicrobial proteins and peptides. Oh, this slide is mainly of antimicrobial peptides. Uh, it is seen uh, that these, there are a lot of antimicrobial peptides in nature. If you go back to nature, then you will probably find answer to a lot of problems that are plaguing us right now. There's a class of small peptides that widely exist in nature, an important part of innate immunity system of different organisms. And they have wide range of inhibitory effects against bacteria, fungi. And it's seen that in already in antimicrobial peptide database at 3,240 AMPs. And uh, these are the properties. The number of amino acids is 10 to 60, and almost all of them are cationic. So this is how they're classified. As you can see on the top, the source, they could be from insects, from amphibians like frogs. It is seen that the frog skin already has something like 300 AMPs. They could be from mammals. They could be from plants, microorganisms themselves. Because a lot of bacteria, they, they have these um, AMPs so that they could compete with other bacteria. So a lot of time, uh, bacteria themselves contribute to these AMPs. And finally, aquatic, that is fish, etc. Then they are also classified uh, according to the amino acid rich, like which of these peptides are rich in which amino acid. So it's seen that glycine, arginine, proline, histidine, and tryptophan are the amino acids which are extremely abundant in these AMPs. The structures are alpha helical, beta sheet, both alpha helical and beta sheet, and linear extension. And finally, activity. Most of them are antibacterial. They could also be antifungal, anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antiparasitic, and anti-cancer. So since we are talking about antimicrobial resistance, I'm going to focus on antibacterial only. So basically, uh, the question is that, do we just take antimicrobial peptides from nature and we start using them? No, because there are a lot of riders over there. Sometimes you have a very long peptide sequence and you have very short half-life. That half-life means when, so when you inject a certain compound inside your body, like a peptide or a drug, then how long does it last? So that is a simple definition. Cytotoxic, that means it could, it's possible that some of those AMPs could be toxic to the human host. Then they could be sensitive, salt sensitive, and unoptimized delivery. You know, you may want them to go to a certain site but they, are going, they may go to another site. So you have to make sure that the delivery is to the exact site where it is required. So what is required is that if you just go for the entire natural AMP, there would be limited commercial applications. However, if you, uh, you use template-assisted synthesis, then you could just probably take out that particular domain from that entire structure, which is... Uh, which has the maximum antibacterial effect, you could improve half-life, greater potency, make it less cytotoxic, and you make sure that the delivery of that particular peptide is exactly at the site. And after improving this particular AMP, 
you could make it a commercial available therapeutic so that is the idea because a lot of people get worried about this that if we just take the uh, anti uh, bacterial protein or peptide then is it going to be effective uh, most likely no you have to go through this entire steps till you make it effective so these are some of the natural antimicrobial peptides which are in the market towards your left you will see the red table these are in the market as you can see uh, i've shown some of the uh, photographs of those now these these have come straight from nature and right now they're doing a very good job of uh, being antibiotics and uh, some of these peptides as you can see in the purple table they're still going through clinical trials and these are just some of the examples there are many more so now i will come to after giving a particular base i will come to some natural antimicrobial proteins that we are doing in our lab so natural antimicrobial proteins are futures to false for novel antibiotics the first one that uh, we going to talk about is lactoferrin that comes from it's majorly found in milk but it is also found in all exocrine secretions i will talk about it in detail the second is momodin now this is uh, this we uh, is a ribosome inactivating protein and this we have got uh, from certain seeds of a fruit and finally peptidoglycan recognition protein that is found in camel milk now what is interesting is that we have got these proteins from different sources lactoferrin we've got from human milk peptidoglycan recognition protein we have got from camel milk and momodin we have got from a certain fruit which is also known as balsam apple so uh, why i though we are working on many other proteins but i have focused uh, only uh, these three proteins in this presentation because all these three are from different sources and all these three have different mechanisms of action so let's first talk about ribosome inactivating proteins momodin is an um, ribosome inactivating protein mechanism of action is that uh, it stops the protein synthesis so ribosome inactivating proteins rips are enzymes which depurinate rib ribosomal rna they impede the process of translation they inhibit it, they inhibit the protein synthesis so this is momodica balsamina or the balsam apple it's a brilliantly brightly colored red fruit that we find and uh, actually if you see the seeds are red in color and uh, they are quite toxic and the protein that we have isolated from the red seeds is known as momodin so um, to explain how momodin works let me take you to uh, dna structure the in the dna structure the nucleotide is a building block of dna it consists of uh, a nitrogenous base which is connected to uh, a sugar it could be deoxyribose in case of dna and ribose in case of rna and that is connected to a phosphate so a nucleotide consists of sugar molecule attached to phosphate base and a nitrogen containing base of uh, so basically all these yellow structures that you seeing inside the dna are nucleotides which are stacked with each other and connected with each other so what your rip does is that it is able to do an n glycosidic cleavage which releases specific adenine base from sugar phosphate backbone of 28 s r r n a so in this slide you can see that the cleavage occurs at this point so you have two products you have uh, the phosphate and sugar attached together and you have uh, the base over here so once it cleaves that then the protein synthesis is stopped that very moment so these are three types of rips that are found in nature type 1 ris rip is simply an enzyme and glycosidase type 2 rip is that enzyme which is connected by a disulfide bond to another molecule which is a lectin so which has got carbohydrate binding domains and uh, side chains carbohydrate side chains and then finally type 3 rip which has n glycosidase and an unknown domain so type 3 rips are still being worked upon they are not known that much but type 1 and type 2 rips are already been worked upon so this just to uh, simplify and show you the structure of rip this inside you can see these uh, yellow residues these this is the active site which goes and binds 
to the nucleotides and is able to depurinate the, the nucleotide and as a result, it stops the protein synthesis. Now next, I will come to lactoferrin. So lactoferrin is a red protein that protects babies by binding to bacterial iron. So this particular protein has been created by nature and its concentration is highest in the colostrum. That is the first milk which is given to the babies. And that is why it is stressed that uh, the first milk should be given to, uh, to babies as soon as possible because it contains lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is a very, very effective antimicrobial protein. So it is the complete armor for the neonate, defense, nutrition, and development. And it, the mechanism of action of lactoferrin is that it is an iron binding protein. So it sequesters the iron, means it takes the iron away from iron requiring bacteria. Now, when there is no iron, then those iron requiring bacteria are not able to uh, exist. So that is how it kills bacteria, but that is just one of the actions. There are several other actions as I will. I will talk about later. So these are lactoferrin sources mainly found in milk and in milk also maximally in cholesterol, also in synovial fluid, sweat, pancreatic fluids, and all these exocrine secretions also in neutrophils. So the antimicrobial function is mainly by iron sequestration as I have spoken just now, but it also inhibits biofilms. If you remember, I've spoken about biofilms. So it has been seen that lactoferrin is able to inhibit biofilms which is what is so much required for these uh, resistant bacteria. It is able to bind to lipopolysaccharides. Now lipopolysaccharides are found in the cell membrane. So of bacteria, and then it contains certain peptides. Lactoferrin it's in itself contains peptides, which are antimicrobial peptides, AMPs, which bind to bacterial proteases. So when they bind to pro bacterial proteases, that is bacterial proteins, then the bacteria is not able to grow anymore. And then, of course, this slide is just to show that it does several other functions. It's, it's a wonder protein. It's a moonlighting protein. It also does immunomodulation, anti-inflammatory, gastropathy re reduction, wound healing, anti-cancer, etc. But for now, for this presentation, we'll focus only in the, on, on its antibacterial function. So this is the structure that we have determined in our lab. Lactoferrin has got two lobes, the N-lobe and the C-lobe. N-lobe for the N-terminus, C-lobe for C-terminus. And each lobe is further subdivided into two domains, N1 domain, N2 for N lobe, C1 and C2 for C lobe. And there is an iron which is bound very deeply inside the interdomain cleft. So you can see over here, there are two iron molecules and there is an interconnecting hel helix which connects the C lobe to the N lobe. So after determining the entire lactoferrin structure, we have able to understand how it functions what we can do to improve its functions. We have also been able to discover certain antimicrobial peptides within this particular lactoferrin, which could be separately uh, synthesized and used as drugs for the future. So I'll talk about three particular peptides that have been discovered in lactoferrin and all of them are in towards the N terminus portion. First one, the blue one is L LF11. The pink one is lactoferrampin and the green one is lactoferrisin. So this are, these are the structures of these particular peptides. As you can see, they're all differently structured. If I talk about LF11 first, the, it's already in the clinical trial phase two. The location of this particular peptide is at the, right at the end terminus. What is interesting about this particular peptide is it's got four arginines, as you can see in the in this particular diagram, there are four R genes right in the beginning. And uh, the, it is able to uh, basically kill a lot of bacteria. And if you see Isonetobacter bomini, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, all these are resistant bacteria. And of course, Candida species, which are fun fungi. Its architecture is beta strand. And it is seen that if you just make LF1 to 11, LF2 to 11, that means if you uh, if you don't make the first arginine, only you start from the second arginine. 3 to 11, that means if you, uh, basically this is protein architecture and studies on it. And it is, it is shown that it's still manageable. It still shows comparable activities. But if you start this from the fourth arginine, then it is less potent. So it is obvious 
This also gives a kind of a guidance on making a very effective antimicrobial peptide. That you need all those four arginines at the beginning of the peptide. Then lactoferampin. Now this is a helical structure, as you can see. It is that one was beta span. It is also in the N one domain. Re residues two sixty eight to two eighty four of lactoferrin. And these are the that it is able to inhibit. It's not then uh, the, it is seen that lactoferrin is more potent than the whole lactoferrin molecule. So this again is a, a very effective drug that could be made in the future. And again, if you study the architecture, then cleavage at both terminal results in decrease, but C terminal is more critical. Then the last uh, peptide is lactoferrin. Now it is different from both those peptides. Those were, one was beta strand, one was alpha helix. Now this has both alpha helix and beta strand connected by a disulfide bond. So there is a loop in the center. And this one, once again, is more potent than the whole molecule. And uh, residue 17, 17 to 41 at the end terminus. And this is found to be a very broad spectrum antibiotic. As you can see, Listeria, monocytogenes, Bacillus, Satellites, E. coli, Pseudomonas, Origenesa. And these are only some of the bacteria. It's able to kill many, many more. And it is seen that it is produced on its own when lactoferrin goes inside the stomach. It is caused by uh, the action of pepsin inside the stomach. So this could very well be nature's way of making a very potent antibiotic inside your stomach and especially required for uh, small neonates, small babies who are defenseless against bacteria because their immunity is yet to develop. So looking at uh, lactoferrin, one can also uh, develop more antibiotics and also this is already in clinical trial phase two. Then I will talk about another fragment of lactoferrin that we have discovered in our lab. Now this particular fragment binds and inactivates a microbial enzyme which is known as proteinase K. Similar enzymes are also uh, present in many many bacteria also known as satellisin. So as you can see the red portion is the enzyme and this green is the lactoferrin peptide that we have gone, we've seen that it goes and binds very, very tightly to the active site of these, this particular enzyme and it stops the growth of bacteria. So this is just to show that it, it is found in the silo. This red peptide that you see is that particular peptide and it is found in the silo and it causes bacteriostasis that is stops the growth and it preserves lactoferrin. And this is just an animation to show how it acts. Now this blue portion is the bacterial enzyme. And uh, this particular site inside is your active site. So uh, basically this is how the substrate binds to it. But what happens is if you make a lactoferrin, that particular lactoferrin peptide, which binds to the active site, it binds tightly and it is unable, after that, the substrate is unable to bind to it. So this is how it could be an effective drug and we are already working on trying to take it to the trials. After finishing with lactoferrin, I will talk about structure of peptidoglycan recognition protein that is PGRT. Now this we have isolated from camel milk. As you know, camel is uh, an animal which lives in very, very harsh conditions. And it is, um, if you see the sands of deserts, they are teeming with extremely, extremely resistant bacteria. And PGRP is found in camel so that it protects camel from those bacteria. So that this particular protein can be used for future design for our antibiotics. And how does it act? Basically, you have these three particular um, molecules which are present in in the cell membrane of bacteria, gram positive, you have uh, lipotechoic acid, gram negative, you have lipopolysaccharides, and PG, and that is peptidoglycan, is present in both gram positive and gram negative. And we have been able to demonstrate that PGN and uh, LPS and LTA, all of them are able to bind to PGRP. So, uh, through this, I have basically tried to show three kind of natural proteins, natural antibiotic proteins, which are present in nature and could be used in future for um, basically antibacterial therapeutics in humans too. 
Finally, I will uh, end my presentation with uh, this particular quote uh, by Dr. Abdul Kalam. He said that widespread use of antibiotics promotes the spread of antibiotic resistance. Smart use of antibiotics is the key to controlling its spread. So especially in today's times when COVID-19 is um, all over, it is rampant and uh, everybody is experiencing very confusing uh, symptoms. Half the time, people do not know whether it is a viral disease or a bacterial disease. It is very, very important to uh, take, uh, to first of all, get tested and also to take uh, the advice of a good doctor and also to use antibiotics extremely judiciously so that we do not make our bodies so resistant to antibiotics that when we actually have some major problem, a major disease, that we are unable to fight it. And if you see in, in most of the ICUs of uh, hospitals, it's seen that, uh, you know, they're just teeming with these uh, resistant bacteria. And uh, it's very difficult to uh, combat them because of the formation of biofilms all over the medical um, apparatus like catheters and tubes and all. And once uh, we get critical and go inside these ICUs, it's very, very difficult to come out of there mainly because of these severe resistant bacteria. So what is required from our end is that we, we have to take care of uh, uh, our antibiotic dosage. First of all, make sure that we require antibiotics, only then we take. And if we are given a certain dosage, then we have to finish that particular dosage. Do not leave it in the middle thinking that now we are well, we don't need to take any more antibiotic because we are having side effects. So we have to be extremely careful the medical fraternity has to be extremely careful in, in giving very judicious uh, dosage of antibiotics. And of course, um, there has to be a global kind of a, um, a, an effort that we do not uh, give too much antibiotics to livestock and we are careful generally. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, for this wonderful talk. And uh, if I summarize the whole lecture, that uh, antibiotics are medicines used to prevent and treat bacterial infections. And uh, the focus on to the antibacterial uh, antibiotic resistance is it is uh, one of the biggest threat to global health. And it is quoted by World Health Organization also uh, in terms of food security and developmental analysis in today's scenario. So antibiotic resistance uh, can affect anyone in at any age in any country. And it occurs naturally, but misuse of antibiotics in humans and animals is accelerating the process, I means this is a cause. Growing number of infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, uh, uh, some many more diseases are become harder to treat as antibiotic used to treat them become less effective. So uh, this resistance leads to longer hospital stays, higher medical cost and increased mortality. So somehow the uh, this problem has itself a solution of that we have to uh, go for the natural antibiotics, natural proteins, which we have discussed in today's lecture, like in terms of lactoferrin, momoridin and peptidoglycan, uh, uh, recombinant proteins. So uh, these are alternate uh, of the problem, alternate solution of the problem. And uh, scope is very, 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 very wide in terms of research, in terms of development. And uh, definitely this uh, lecture, today's talk, popular lecture organized by, sponsored by Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, focused uh, on to the research, uh, primary research area for the biotechnology student. And there are so many students are uh, joined through a live session on YouTube. And definitely they, uh, they get benefit from this lecture. I'm really thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, for taking time from your busy schedule to be the guest speaker of the day. Uh, today, uh, uh, we also have uh, Dr. Naresh Prithi, Dean Agricultural Sciences uh, of IMT University. I welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you so much, ma'am. And this is really wonderful talk. And this uh, uh, is uh, available every time on uh, YouTube. So thank you so much, ma'am, uh, once again.
Thank you. Thank you so much.